Well, good morning again, church. We've been looking at making our families into a blessing, uh, starting last week and going for the next few weeks. Uh, how do we get beyond just enduring our families and really making them a, a source of blessing for ourselves and a blessing to our community, to the world around us, something that God can use, something that God has honored in? How do we make our families better than, than what we often experience in this world? You know, I shared with you last week, I challenged you to be part of the, the 10%. Rather than the 90 that, that goes along with the idea of comfort and security and will endure anything as long as we're comfortable, to be the 10% that is willing to risk, that is willing to change, that is willing to be intentional and do something to make your situation different, especially the situation within your family. And I challenged you last week that, that one of the things that makes a difference in making a family meaningful and making a family closer to what God wants out of us is that we need to have a mission. We need to have a purpose as a family. And that we need to make that purpose, that mission, we need to be intentional about making it serving God in this world. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord, Joshua challenged the people of Israel. And that is our challenge, to take up that same mantle, that in our families, we're going to serve God, we're going to honor God, we're going to be intentional, we're going to ch change the status quo, the situation that we are born into and dealing with, and we are going to be someone who honors God in our families. Well, there's more to it than just having a, a mission, uh, just as there's more to us being a family, a church family, than just having a, a mission. You have to have a foundation that you build upon. So I want to share a little bit more with you this morning about what it takes to be the family that God is really designing and calling for you to be. Well, in, a, in our family, you might not believe this if you would talk to her today, but in our family, when Rebecca, our youngest daughter, was growing up, she did not have a filter. In fact, I'm pretty sure she did not even know what a filter was when she was a kid. Some of you out there know what that's, uh, what that's like to deal with, right? As parents, you kind of went through that same situation where you're always walking on eggshells wondering what she's, what, what's going to be said. Um, in fact, we even had an arrangement with her, her kindergarten teacher, who was a member of our church to make things even more complicated. Uh, the arrangement was that she wouldn't believe anything that Rebecca said about us as long as we wouldn't believe anything that Rebecca said about her. So... <laughs> Like I said, you wouldn't believe it now when you talk to her and know her, um, but when she was younger, you know, we were always kind of wondering uh, what, was going to, what was going to come out of her mouth, what she was going to say, uh, because if she thought it, you were going to hear it, usually sooner rather than later. Um, in fact, it reminds me, you know, ever since television started, there has been a show that has been rebooted and brought back to TV over and over again that deals with that, that exa exact same fear. Uh, you remember the show Kids Say the Darndest Things? Yeah. It features the whole idea of, of kids without filters who will say anything about life, about the world, especially about their families, and then you get to see the reaction of the parents that are mortified, right? Turning red in the face. And, and it's, it's like a universal fear, fear in our family is that, that you don't know necessarily what's going to come out of those young minds. You don't know what the kids are going to say, what they're going to to do. Uh, but there's, a, there's actually a little bit of, a, of help that I can give you for that situation that, you're, that, that we all uh, deal with from time to time. If you're worried about what's going to come out of your kid's mouth, you need to worry first about what you're putting into their minds, what's influencing them, what you're allowing to influence them. And in fact, the scripture tells us the same thing. God's word tells us the exact same things, that, that we need to, to guard what we are putting into the minds of our, our children, what we are putting into and allowing to influence our families. And I want to share with you a scripture reading this morning that deals specifically with that. It comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6 in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and it's verses 4 through 9. This is one of the most important passages in the Old Testament. In fact, uh, you're going to recognize some of these words that are said if you've been around church for a while, some of these words in this passage, uh, because not only is this an important passage for the Jewish people, this is a passage that Jesus quotes later in the New Testament when he talks about what is the most important commandment for us 
as his followers. It comes directly out of this passage from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. So if you've got your Bibles, uh, open up to, to Deuteronomy right at the beginning of your Bible, chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. It says, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Like I said, this is actually one of the most important passages in the whole Old Testament. One of the most important passages. The first words of this passage, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God is one, is what's referred to as the Shema. In Hebrew, from the Hebrew word Shema means to hear. It is a prayer that is prayed by a Jewish person every single morning in every single Israel. Shema, O Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. This is a prayer that defines who they are. And then the, verses, the next verse right after it is the verse that Jesus went to when he was asked, what is the most important commandment? What's the most important thing for us to do if we are going to be children of God? And Jesus' response was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, right? He's quoting from this passage where Moses tells the people of Israel to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul. And then the word that he uses at the end there, with all your strength, is, is actually with all of your muchness, with all of your abundance, with everything about who you are, with everything that makes you who you are. Love the Lord your God with that, your mind, your strength, your soul, everything about you. Love the Lord your God. The greatest commandment comes right from this passage. And when you look at the context of this passage, not only is it the prayer that defines the people of Israel, and not only is it the greatest commandment according to Jesus, it is all in the context of how we are to live in our families. Did you notice that? It says, commit yourselves to these commandments that I'm giving you today, Moses said. And then make them a part of your family and your household. Repeat them again and again to your children, right? Because it doesn't take just one time of telling a child something, right? Repeat them again and again and again and again is the idea here. Repeat them over and over. Make it a part of your family. Whether you're at home or whether you're traveling, whether you're going in or out of your home, whether it's the beginning of the day, the end of the day, every part of your day, make it about the Word of God. That's how important this passage is. That's how important this idea of making Scripture the foundation of our families is. It needs to be incorporated into every part of our life if our families are going to be what God desires for them to be. Make it a part of every single facet of our life. Because, you know, what you put into the minds of your family what you put into the minds of your children is what's going to come out later, right? And it will come out later not just in what they say, but it will come out later in what they do and how they live their life. If you want an example of it, just look around you at the world, at the types of music that people listen to and how it shapes the way they think, the way they act, the way they dress, the cars that they drive the way they shape their families, what you take into your mind shapes what comes out of your life. You know, it's a concept that science calls brain plasticity. That's the way we refer to it today. It's the idea that our brains are moldable. The pathways that, that messages take inside of our brains can be changed. They can be shaped by the influence of the world around us. It, it's why someone who goes through a stroke with a lot of work, can sometimes learn how to walk and how to talk again and how to get mobility back. Sometimes they can do that because there is enough plasticity left in their brain that they can rewire it with a lot of work to make some of those things happen. We see it a lot more with kids, though, with children. The way they learn, the way that a, a, an infant learns in this world is by observing the world around them. And, and as they observe what's happening around them, 
their brain is making connections and it's forming pathways so that things become automatic to them. Controlling their hands and arms and legs becomes automatic to them because those pathways are wired into their brain from observing the world. And, and as they grow older, the things that they speak, the things that they, they talk about, the words that they use, they, they form these pathways by observing the world around them. And their brain is always developing. In fact, we know that, that children's brains are usually developing up until about the age of 20, uh, maybe even a little bit longer for some people. It takes that long for, for these pathways to develop, for us to, to really kind of get our, our, our life and our brains in order sometimes. Our brains are very, very moldable. And so the Scripture tells us that as we're bringing up children, as we're establishing our families, make your family about God's Word. Make your family about Scripture so that that is what influences them. So that is what molds the way that they think, the way those pathways are formed in their brains. Let Scripture be what, what informs them. Let Scripture be what influences them so that it comes out of their life and later will come out of their actions as well. You know, the Bible also tells us, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it, right? It's the same idea. You fill your family with the Word of God. Make that the foundation of your family because you are shaping the future for your children. You are changing the way your family thinks and acts the more that you bring Scripture into your family. You know, over the years that I've been in the church, I have heard the, the accusation more than one time that in the church we're really good at talking about mission, but we're not really good at training for our missions. Uh, in fact, I've just recently heard it, heard it again, that we, we can talk about our missions a lot. We can talk about the fact that we need to be an influence in this world. We need to be sharing our faith, but we don't always do a great job of, well, how do you do that? So how do we make Scripture a part of our families? How do we make it the thing that influences our children more than the world around us, more than the culture around us? How do we really shape the way that they think? Well, let me tell you, since most of you in here are the adults in your family, let me start by telling you that it needs to start with you. If you want Scripture to influence your family, you need to first of all let it start influencing you. You need to be reading it. You need to be studying it. You need to be daily in God's Word, making it a part of the way you think and the way you act and the way that you react to the world around you. If you're not being influenced by it, it's never going to uh, sift down into your children and into the rest of your family. So you need to, first of all, be a part of Scripture every day yourself, and then you need to talk about it. There is no shortcuts in families for communication, for talking. You have to talk about it in your families. You have to make it a part of your conversation. What are you learning from Scripture? What are you praying about? How is God answering your prayers? Talk about what you're reading together as a family. Study it together. Ask questions of Scripture. Study and investigate those questions together. This can be something you talk around, about around the dinner table rather than just the, the awkward silences. Talk about what you're reading, what you're studying. And you know what? Not only are you bringing God's word into the minds of your family members, you're also setting the example for them of what's most important, what they need to be doing in their life. You're developing the patterns that will later shape the actions of your family members and your children. Make Scripture a part of every single day in your family. Pray together. Study God's Word together. When you're in the car, listen to worship music. That brings God's Word into your families. And it brings it into your families in a way that, that often jumps past our questions and our doubts and shapes people more than you can possibly imagine. Because music has that power over us. Make it a part of your life. And I, I know it's going, to, it's going to feel awkward. It's going to feel forced at first if you haven't been doing it all along. Just recognize that's a reality. That's part of change. Every change feels awkward and forced at first until you get used to it. So, so endure the uncomfort. 
Uh, endure the, the risk. Make it a part of your family because in the long run, it is going to pay off. You know, when our girls were little, we always listened to, to Christian music. We still, that's, that's what we listen to whenever we're in the car. Uh, and, and when you get those moments when you're in the car and you hear them singing along in the back seat, you recognize it's been worth it. You know, we were careful about what we let our girls watch when they were growing up. Uh, you know, of course, there was, you know, Dora the Explorer, Disney, princess movies, stuff like that. But, but you know, we made sure it was VeggieTales and, and other things like that that taught them God's word. Read Bible stories to them before they go to bed every night. Talk about the Bible with them. When you make it a part of your family, it affects the person they become later on. And it's not just with our children. It happens, you know, even in our, our marriages. It happens even when we're adults and our children are grown. We can still shape the way that our family thinks and acts and reacts to the world around us if we make Scripture the center of what we're doing. So I want to give you a, a challenge here this morning. Just a, a really simple kind of challenge, and I know it's going to feel a little difficult at first if you haven't been doing things like this before, but I think in the long run you're going to find that, that if you can develop new patterns in your family, it's going to make things better down the road. And your family can become a source of blessing rather than something you just endure. It can become what God wants it to be, a, a force of change and blessing in this world. So I want to give you a, a, a simple challenge. It, it's just going to stretch over the next 21 days. So from today until uh, May 21st, just over these next 21 days, three weeks, that's all I'm asking, three weeks. I want to challenge you for 21 days to read one chapter of the Gospel of John each day. There's 21 chapters. Doesn't that work out conveniently? So three weeks, 21 days, read one chapter of the Gospel of John each day. And the caveat, the hook in all of this, is that you also need to talk about it in your family. Read a chapter of John a day and then talk about it in your family. And I know, like I said, it's going to feel forced. It's going to feel like it's difficult to do. It's going to be hard to find the time. In fact, when you commit yourself to this, I can guarantee you that the enemy is going to be working against you. He's going to fill your schedule so full, it's going to feel like you don't have time for it. Make it a priority. Make it a priority. And I'm telling you to do this for two reasons. One of the reasons why I'm telling you to do this is because we know that from the studies of the brain, the brain plasticity, it takes 21 days to develop a new habit. You have to consistently do it for 21 days, and it forges new patterns in your brain. Scripture starts to become a part of the way you think. So do it for 21 days and see what happens internally in the way you look at the world, in the way you interact with the world around you, and in the way your family interacts. So 21 days form a new habit, reading the Gospel of John. And the second reason I'm doing it for you, I'm challenging you to do this, is because I believe it's going to be a blessing for your family. It's going to change and shape the way that you act with each other and the way you react to each other as you study the life of Jesus, and it's going to change the way that you interact with the world around you so that you can be the blessing God intends you to be. Like I said, it's going to feel forced. You're going to have all kinds of things come up against you. You're going to feel like you just can't even get through the surface of the Scripture. I guarantee you that's going to happen. But press on. Stick with it. You're not going to get much beyond the surface of it you know, until you have have really filled your heart and mind with God's Word and you start to see the connections and deeper meanings. There's no shortcut to it. you got to do this intentionally and stick with it to really have it influence your life. So that's my challenge for all of us as we go from May 1st to May 21st. Let's read a chapter a day and see how it changes you, your outlook, your family, and even our church family here. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that when we hide your word in our heart, that it changes the way we think. It changes the way we interact with the world. It changes us. Father, we thank you that 
you have promised that your word is living, your word is real, your word is powerful to affect change in the world around us. So often, Lord, we admit, we, we, we humbly admit that we just don't take it seriously. Lord, we give all kinds of lip service to living by your word, but we don't always live it out. It sits on our shelf. It sits on our desk. We just kind of give it, a, give it lip service. But Father, we've got to study it if it's going to change who we are. We've got to read it. We've got to be a part of it every single day because it's your voice speaking to us. It's you giving us the guidance that we need in the mission that we have in this world. As individuals and as families and as churches, we've got to be a part of your word daily, regularly. It has to be the foundation of who we are. So Father, we, we make the commitment to you here today that we're going to be in your word, especially in our families. And Lord, we know there's going to be all kinds of distractions. There's going to be all kinds of struggles. It's not going to feel natural at first. It's going to feel like we're not making any progress. It's not doing any good. But in reality, Lord, it is. Because the more we take in your word and hide it in, the heart, in our hearts, the more it shapes who we are and the more it shapes uh, our futures, Father. It makes us into the people and the families you design us to be. So God, we make it our commitment to be in your word. Give us the strength that we need. Give us the consistency that we need. Give us the encouragement that we need so that we can be the people that you need us to be. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.